welcome to another episode of Offsides, everything NFL and NHL. Uh, starting off here, again, um, with free agency around the corner here, some guys moving around. Uh, one of the teams that had high aspirations of a postseason run last year, the Colts. Uh, missed out on the playoffs. I think they had a 97% chance with two weeks to go. They, they, they lose their last two games and miss it. Looking at the quarterback position here, Carson Wentz, one year with the Colts, uh, talks of him potentially moving. Um, do you think Indy should keep him or deal him away and test the free agency market once again? Uh, should they get rid of him before March 16th, which is, the, again, the new calendar year for the NFL? Uh, Indy would save $13.3 million instantly and then obviously not have to pay out the $53.4 million over his next two seasons as well. So dealing him out would obviously save them a lot of money. Do you think that it's uh, time to pump the brakes and move on from him, or do you think um, they give him another shot this year? Um, honestly, the Colts team being that close, they know that they can run the ball. They have a stellar defense. They have good wide receivers where they did struggle was at the quarterback position. I look at them similar to how I look at the Cleveland Browns. You have a great team all around you. You just have the one spot, one of the most, if not the most important position on the field plays great plays terrible. Like there's no consistent. That's the word. There's no consistency. You never know what you're going to get. Mm-hmm. And t- until the moment is right there. I think that they should cut bait with him. Um, there's a handful of guys that I even would consider bringing in. Um, Mitchell Trubisky, all, ru- all things around him. Great that he was with the Bills this season, the game that he got to play. He showed out. He did very well. Um, Jimmy G, not number one guy going to a similar play style offense where it is heavy play action, a lot of running. You still do have your superstars in the positions that you need him. I could see him fitting right in there and and doing very well, just like he did for San Francisco. Um, Tyrod Taylor, what is his condition? How healthy is he going to be? Um, Yeah. Do you go make a move? Russell Wilson, Kirk Cousins. Like there's a handful of guys out there that could potentially like, and, and I feel like all they need is one, like all they're looking for is just one good year with this. Like they're just looking for one guy to step in for one good year, one short term brief time and go win one now because their team is so good and they are so close. Yeah. I, I see them. I, I would, th- I shouldn't say I see them. I would think it would be the in their best is- interest if they would move on and cut bait from Carson Wentz. You did talk about the money that they save Granted, Jimmy G is going to be a pretty penny, but you could lock him down to a long-term deal and push some of that cap down down the road. Um, That seems the best fit to me would be Jimmy G going to the Colts. Yeah, I agree with you as far as Jimmy G kind of being the best fit there. Like like you said, isn't going to be relied upon a ton, again, with uh, in San Francisco, Elijah Mitchell, Mitchell, uh, Raheem Mostert when he is healthy, obviously Debo Samuel, a big part of the run game, um, thrive again in the uh, play action, things like that. Talent wise, arm wise, dis- decision wise, I think Jimmy Garoppolo checks the boxes over Carson Wentz in all of those categories right now. Um, yeah, and just with, like, like you said, with Wentz being super inconsistent. Um, when they needed him most at the end of the season, I mean, Taylor was still 80 yards minimum, 80 to 150, two to four touchdowns a game. And sometimes it wasn't enough to where it's like, okay, you're, you're running back, even though having a good run game is very important. Your quarterback, when relied upon, and it's third and eight. You can't run the ball when you're down a couple scores in the fourth quarter. You can't run the ball as much because you're going to leave yourself with no time in the end. You need to turn and lean on a quarterback. And Jimmy G has been that guy in clutch situations when needed that he steps up and does get it done. Um, 
and then, I mean, a couple other guys you mentioned too, not uh, free agents and not super desperate on the market, but like Kirk Cousins, Russell Wilson, those are two guys as well that I would put definitely above Carson Wentz right now. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, between now, like I said, now on March 16th, they'd save themselves over $13 million if they get rid of him. Uh, like even Cam Newton. Yeah. Like – in the most important game of the season, their quarterback that they paid all this money to had a 4.4 QBR against Jacksonville in a must-win game, get into the playoffs. You can't have that. No. No. And that should that's all you really have to say. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember who, did they, who they played the week before that, but they basically – They should have won. I, I don't remember, but they should have won I think that, it was I believe. The Ra- was it the Raiders? I'm looking right now. Yeah, I think it was, yeah, going into week 17, it was a 97% chance, meaning if they won Raiders, that yeah. if they won that game or they won against Jacksonville, they were in. And they, and they were ball. at home. And they were at home against Vegas. Yeah. Um, and again, Jacksonville, top to bottom, not a very good team. Raiders, not a very good defense. If I remember, they weren't one of the best run-stopping defenses. Um. Yeah. And then they get pounced by Jacksonville. Yeah. The worst team in the league when their whole fans are dressed as clowns mocking their franchise and they stomp a team that's arguably going to win the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that would, that game to me just – that wrapped up Carson Wentz with the Colts right there. Yeah. And, and like, like – Oh, sorry. I was just going to say when it, the game's on the line – you're down, crunch time. You got to start passing the ball. Again, as you mentioned, that 4.4 QBR, you're not getting it done. And, I mean, like, I understand Frank Reich getting the head coaching job here, him being with Carson in Philly, bringing him over, knowing what type of guy he is, because that is a huge part of being a leader. Watching Hard Knocks, he is a great leader. He does have all the guys loving him because he does basically want to die on every single play that he he every snap that he takes because he goes 100 percent. but there's a time where performance comes a little bit higher than being that guy when you need to get it done and -hmm. almost every single game that they needed to get it done like almost every every like big game this year they like lost rams they lost They lose to the Titans. They lose to the Ravens in overtime. Like, they lose to the Titans again in overtime. Yeah, they stomped the Bills. Bills had off weeks here and there. They lose to Tampa. And then, yeah, they they look like they're ending strong, beating New England and Arizona. But those both of those franchises, as what we saw, got quickly erased in the playoffs because they weren't of that caliber. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, like does the relationship between head coach GM and quarterback, because they like each other as people, do they prioritize that and they keep him? But if I feel like if they want to win now with a lot of their defensive players that they have on their team, how long they're going to be able to keep that group together. I feel like the, the urgency is at an all-time high for them. Mm -hmm. Like, Leonard, he's been banged up on and off. Like, Mm -hmm. their defensive ends, Buckner, he's getting a little older. Like, T.Y., how many more seasons has he got in the tank? Mm -hmm. Like, he almost retired this year. Yeah, his neck – yeah, they had a neck injury that basically almost ended his career. Yep. And then, yeah, Jonathan Taylor going out of his third season, the very short uh, shelf life of NFL running backs. You're really only going to get another one to three seasons of this kind of productivity out of him before you, you start to decline, especially with him being a thicker bruiser, like I'm going to run you over and not try to outrun you kind of guy. Um, those guys don't last. I mean, Marshawn Lynch, perfect example only had two to four years of really like, holy shit, this guy's the real deal. And then he dropped off quickly and then made his exit. I see Jonathan Taylor more as like an Emmett Smith 
because of the offensive line that they do have, those guys are fucking beasts. Like if they mm-hmm. can consistently keep a great offensive line, he gets to the second, third level before he's even touched. Like most of the times when he's right, he barely even gets hit. Mm-hmm. Like, cause he knows how to avoid it. And he's so fast. Like that's the one thing people don't realize about him is like, he has the speed to take it to the goalpost every single time he touches the ball. And he doesn't look that flat. Like he doesn't look that fast. No. He's so smooth. Like he's just so smooth. It just, mm-hmm. it's incredible. I Even can, from watching it at Wisconsin, same thing gets past the linebackers. And it's like the camera is watching him going to the end zone and you look 10, 15 yards behind him. You don't even see anybody. Like he's got that much space between him and the next guy. Yeah. RBU. Um, so many running backs coming out of there, getting to the NFL. The next one coming up, Braylon Allen, who's currently at, the, at Wisconsin. But yeah, I mean, I feel like the offensive line is going to be the biggest part of his career. And yeah, getting a quarterback, not having to rely on that run <laughs> to get him that many touches, unless you're going to go to a one, two little thunder lightning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like I said, it'll be you're kind of starting all with the timeline, I guess. If if they want to save money, they got to get rid of him in the next two weeks. So uh, obviously, we'll know in a very short amount of time here what they decide to do with him. Yeah, abs- absolutely. Um, like you said, the new season starts March sixteenth. It's going to be very interesting to see kind of what goes on. Um, on to my question for you here, coming with this new season, coming March 16th, Aaron Donald, um, do you think if we see him return, do you think we see him back atop of the top 100? As this guy's literally been number one, I feel like every single year he's been yeah. in the league. <laughs> the dude's a freak, man. I mean, regardless of if he stays or go is the top 100 is based off the prior season. So stay or go would should, wouldn't have an effect, but yeah, I mean, I can't think of anybody who you'd put above him just because when he was needed most in the biggest game of the year, he stepped up and did what he needed to do. Um, never really, like watching him all season was in times where it's like, oh, he's losing his touch. He's getting overpowered by guys. Um, he's that part of that side of his line is giving up too many big runs, things like that. Um, and then on top of it, him being an interior defensive lineman, he puts up edge rusher numbers, which is even more impressive because being on the inside, there's times you're getting double, double teamed, tripled and then you get past that double team. Oh, and I get it. The running backs trying to get a, a chip on you too. So yeah, two more often than not, two or three guys are trying to uh, put a head on you. So um, yeah, after the, this past season, I mean, there's a couple of guys that like, they're going to be in the top five that, I mean, like Cooper cup, Aaron Rodgers, um, Jonathan Taylor, kind of going to be in that top five, top six that are going to be like in the conversation. But again, like I said, he just super consistent and when needed most, he stepped up and did what he needed to do in the Super Bowl. So I don't think, I don't think there's anybody who takes that away from him this year. Yeah, I absolutely 100% agree with you. Um, I think he's top five defense players of all time. Oh, yeah. um, and he is the only player in the Super Bowl era with seven straight first team all pro selections. Like that is just insane um, to do that. And considering Tom Brady didn't even have that done. Mm-hmm. Like he's the only player, one of one. And yeah, just like that, one of one, he's at the top of the list. Like you said, facing double, triple teams literally on every single play, getting to choose sometimes to go out to the end where you're getting chipped by the tight end. And then you got the guard or the tackle, excuse me. And then you have a back um, to do what he does to watch, to literally, if you just watch 
of like go to YouTube, type in Aaron Donald highlights. If you just watch that, there's no way your mouth isn't by yeah. the time it is over because he is he's an all time he's a generational player. He's a one of one. Mm-hmm. And yeah, just like you said about him um, with the all all pro, with how hard that is to do. Just to get one, maybe two all pro first team all pro selections in your career is great to do it seven times in a row, especially at that position, because he's not on the field for every defensive snap defensive linemen rotate out a lot there's really a rotation of every team has three to five guys to keep him fresh rotating in so to be able to do what he does on maybe 75 to 90 percent of the of defensive snaps so you're not on the field all the time that your your teammates are are taking potential highlights and tackles and all that away from you so for him to be able to do that where uh, in other positions, receiver, usually your number, if you're number one receiver, you're on the field 90 to 99% of the time. You'll take one or two breathers a game or based on personnel, you're off the field a couple of times. Quarterback, you're on the field every single play. So you have an opportunity to create that highlight reel on 100% or 95 to 100% of your snaps on your side of the ball. Aaron Donald, on the other hand, like I said, you're rotating in and out to where you're not getting those opportunities every single game, but yet he's still creating those highlight reels. So yeah, like you said, generational talent, top five of all time. Now that he has a Super Bowl uh, under his belt, definitely helps his case as well. Then uh, wrapping up NFL, we'll move over to the ice here. Um, again, getting closer to playoff time, starting to figure out who's going to be the teams there in the end. Uh, in the East, top four teams have been playing phenomenal this season, just five points apart. You have Florida, Tampa, um, Pittsburgh, and Toronto are the Carolina. top Carolina, top four teams out of the East. Um, once playoff time comes, obviously expecting these four teams to be in the postseason, nothing's saying that they won't be at this point. These teams are going to have to start playing each other, and only so many can make it to Eastern Conference Finals, like even the semis. Which of these four teams do you see making an exit first in the playoffs this season? Bearing they don't make any moves and improvement with goaltending or pick up another, maybe go get Phil Kessel, like I mentioned yesterday. I think the Pittsburgh Penguins are going to be going home first if they don't make a move here before the trade deadline. Um, pretty stagnant. I know they went on their huge run earlier, but four, three, and three in their last 10, most of that against the East. Um, yeah, I mean, Sid Malkin and four, four, three or four guys can't carry your team through the postseason. You need a full, a full team. Both the Florida teams and Carolina are full teams. They do play with everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, I see Pittsburgh going if they. Yeah, fuck. Them or the Leafs out of the teams that are probably going to make it are going home first. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of, I'm definitely in the same boat. Just with, I mean, both Florida teams, nothing's really. Just the offensive, offensive scoring, even your goalie on their best night is still not going to be able to. Um, shut down those offenses. You're going to need some help on your offensive side to try to edge out a 6-5, a 7-6 win, just with, again, with how crazy the scoring has been with those top teams. Um, yeah, Pittsburgh and the Leafs, even though they're not in the top four, but again, expecting to be a playoff team. Um, Again, we've talked about the Leafs a couple of times with their playoff curse, not being able to make it out of the first round. Um, haven't really made any moves that are like, okay, they got this guy, 
this is what it's going to take to get over that hump. Um, but yeah, Pitts, Pittsburgh too, like you said, with their goaltending, as far as are they going to be able to hang with some of these top teams that find the back of the net very consistently every night. Um, yeah, I can't, I, I can't think of any of these other teams that have a hole that is a concern for me. So yeah, I'm going to agree with you and say Pittsburgh, um, Toronto before Pittsburgh, just because of their, their history with not being able to get there, but Pittsburgh, I would definitely put there as well. Yeah. And just to note the Maple Leafs lost one of their top defensemen, Jake Muzzin last night, he is placed on long-term IR. So nobody knows right now <laughs> if he's going to be back um, at the end of the season. I mean, with Matthews getting the concussion, Marner, yeah, he's playing a little bit better as of late. But just looking at their last couple games, Blues smacked them 6-3. to three. Montreal beats them 5-2. to two. And I'm surprised it wasn't eight to two Montreal worked them in that game. And then they lose to the blue jackets on Tuesday night in overtime. Um, I just want to verify this. Yes. Toronto was up three to one um, and ended up losing that game. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to agree. Like we said, Toronto and Pittsburgh, but it could even be Toronto number one. Yeah. <clears throat> and again, the trade deadline's still a little ways away. So if they make a move to where it's like, okay, this helps them a little bit, um, then I might feel differently about them. But if they keep everything the same, then it's like, okay, this is where you're at. This is where you've been. You haven't made any changes. How can you make expect a different result? Um, I, I mean, for them to get out of the first round, I feel like it's going to kind of bank on the other team, whoever they face, kind of shitting the bed, having a poor performance uh, to allow them to get out of that first round. Because, I mean, even at their peak, they're not eye-popping to me right now. Um, like they were like a month ago when they were arguably the hottest team on ice even then it was like, okay, but there's still three or four teams that I think are better than them, even at their peak. So it's like, yeah, like I said, unless they make a move, bring in a guy or two, then I'm not going to feel any different about them. Yeah. It's like these teams that are in that running towards the top here. I know we talk a lot mostly about the West because the West is so close now getting a chance kind of to talk about the East here today, there is really only a, like, I'm not going to lie. Every team outside of Pittsburgh is a contender. Uh, I'm going to say even the Caps too. Everyone outside, I feel like the Caps and the Penguins in the Metro and Toronto. I feel like everybody else is cup contending quality. And then with the trade deadline coming, Usually these teams do add a vet, add another piece, add a guy, because you can never have too many <laughs> in case you lose one, which in the NHL playoffs, we all know most of these teams lose a guy for a couple games, if not the whole, and everybody's playing really hurt. So mm -hmm. um, always, always helps to have a guy and maybe the Leafs now. I know yesterday we talked about the defenseman on the market. Maybe now after the losing one, they are on the market to go get one of those guys we talked about. Yeah. Because PK, I could see PK Subban going there, being a Toronto-born kid, going back to Toronto, getting to play for the Leafs, the biggest team in all of Canada. Yeah, I think that was one of the teams I mentioned. They weren't, I think I said Subban to the uh, Knights first, and then I think Leafs were like second or third kind of on the radar as far as teams that would make sense. But yeah, now that you said with them losing one, they probably move up to. I mean, because like I like I said yesterday, the case I made for Vegas was the injuries they have. So some of their top defensemen would make sense. Now, if you're the Leafs, you also insert yourself into that conversation, um, and it feels like like just the pressure of Toronto being the 
probably biggest fan base in hockey of we got to do something otherwise like I mean obviously you go out there and play hockey without any without worrying about what fans and what the outside world thinks of you but again it's kind of like being the Dallas Cowboys and coming up short it's like you know you're America's team you let America down so I feel like the, the Leafs kind of have that same pressure on them Yep, they are definitely that because all of hockey media is in Toronto and Canada. Sportsnet, um, all that is based out of Toronto. That's where all the sports media really comes out of. So talk about like being in New York City as far as like all the media outlets being there, but with an NHL team, that's kind of how those guys don't get away from it. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. a lot of people when they leave there, they say, thank God, because it's so much pressure. Like you said, cameras in your face you lose one night off fucking let's sell the team everybody fucking sucks (laughs) like they're that cutthroat and it's pretty it's pretty crazy to hear some of the stories of of some of the guys who played there yeah well yeah then that wraps up today's episode of offsides be sure to don't have a question oh dude i didn't (laughs) ask mine (laughs) oh shit oh no i didn't dude my bad (laughs) Sorry, everyone, just fooling you. Um, Nikita Kucherov currently sits on top of the NHL in points per game with 1.467 over Connor McDavid. Do you see him as a top five player in the league, if not the most impactful player? Yeah, I mean, at, the, at this point, and kind of pulling up the Lightning roster here just to compare apples to apples, it's – I, I would definitely put him top three, arguably top in the league. Just, I mean, you mentioned the steady leads in there. I'm sure he leads in other stats or he's top three in other stats as well, as far as uh, goal scoring. Um, but I mean, just looking at the lightning roster, some of the, some names to throw out there, you got Stamkos, Braden Point, Victor Hedman, Corey Perry, some other all-star caliber guys, and you're able to put up those numbers individually while on a team of that much firepower, it's it's impressive. Um, where in, in Edmonton, McDavid or Dry Seidel, they put up the numbers, okay, they're only comp- like competing with really their other guy across from them as far as two guys to share the puck with. Like I said, with Tampa, there's five guys that they rely on every night, and if Kucherov's able to put up those kind of numbers. Um, yeah, I would definitely put him in the top three, arguably number one conversation right now in the league. Yeah, I I agree with you. I think he's been on this pinnacle for the last couple of years now. Yeah, Connor McDavid is the best probably. I don't even know. Maybe skilled, but he's not the best player. Um, Nikita Kucherov granted he only has played 15 games this year and he has 22 points just because he was out from his hip surgery just like he missed all of last year comes back in the postseason and leads his entire team in points throughout the playoffs and gets like he's just unbelievable and like you said being on a team with that many guys he's not selfish either like he like everybody I feel like they're so concerned on winning that third Stanley Cup in a row that they could give a fuck who's getting all the points, but it's all the same guys who have basically carried this team from the time they've been there to now. I mean, Tampa's exit, what, that'd be three years ago now when they got upset in the first round by the Columbus Blue Jackets when they got swept. When they won the President's Trophy, Nikita Kutrov won Player of the Year, um, or not Player of the Year, excuse me. He had the most points. And I think he had like 140 something, which is just insane. He hasn't wavered off that at all. Granted, he has missed some time due to his injury, but this guy is the ultimate performer. He does everything out there except for shorthand. He doesn't kill penalties, but does everything out, everything else that there is to be asked for in the game. And I would agree with you. I think he by himself sits on a pinnacle. And even Connor McDavid and Drysaddle, like even like you said, they're competing against each other. They both have seventy three points. <laughs> like mm-hmm. it's pretty crazy to see what you know what happens 
when you have a handful, like a whole bunch of guys on a team together, because Stam Coast, he's 10th. And he's the only one that I can put up there because he's played the majority of the games. Um, but that's middle of the pack, and that's where everybody would kind of be right now. And mm-hmm. Kucherov would be up at the top. Yeah. Yeah, it's def- like, like I said, it's definitely impressive when you have that much firepower on a team and you're still – I mean, even in a, a smaller sample size, but like you said, he's not – selfish he these guys don't care i mean when you, they're scoring five to eight goals a game everybody's kind of involved whether it's scoring or assisting when you have that much success already um which i mean it makes it obviously more fun to play the game when you're scoring and winning that much on teams where you're only putting in one to two goals a night and then i could see that's where it gets a little like you're bumping heads as far as you're okay. You're only getting two goals in the back of the net where you get those guys that might be a little full of themselves of, I need my point tonight. I need my goal. I need my assist where, like I said, when they're fighting the back of the net as often as they do as selfish, selfish or unselfish as these guys want to be, they're all getting involved in some way, assisting or scoring. Yeah, absolutely. And I read an article um, earlier today about Steven Samkos just talking about what, if there's any pressure on them to like win three, all of that type of thing, like how they keep it together. And he goes, I get texts from all my friends on all these other teams and they ask me all the time. He's just like, how do you guys have so seem like you're having so much fun and continue to be like that focused of getting back to that level again? And he just goes, it's just all the guys on the team, like we've all bought into winning and not scoring like it doesn't matter who's who's getting the points it's all about winning and he's just like it's just so crazy he's just like the atmosphere he's just like not like cursing it or anything but like he's just like the atmosphere from the time he won the first cup to right now has stayed the same the entire time like through the second one there was no like downturn no whatever like even with guys missing severe amounts of time um not wavering at all which is just just hats off to the Tampa Bay organization for what they've been able to do with the players that they have, or when they're without them in their lineup, they're still getting the job done, Mm -hmm. which is insane. And John Cooper, you know, he did a great job. He earned, hopefully he gets a lot of money. Yeah. I know he just got an extension, but I didn't get to read how much that was. He deserves it. I mean, fuck. I'm talking, I mean, we're talking about the offensive side as far as the, the, I mean, guys who put the puck in the back of the net. It also helps to have arguably the best goalie, again, top top of the league, top three, top five, in Vasilevsky as well, <laughs> protecting the net on the other end. So it's like. And one of the best defensive too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, as much as you like to see change, I mean, it's also cool to see these dynasties get built like this and be able to witness them as a as a fan. So, obviously, there's other teams that I've picked and I would like to see win it this year, but also if they go back to back to back, I mean, that's unreal. <laughs> yeah, it's unprecedented. I mean, it doesn't happen very often to go back to back, but then back to back to back in professional sports especially in, in a sport where you're playing 82 games and then you play best of seven play, through the playoffs, like that never happens. Mm-hmm. Given the injuries, people are retiring, change and manage, like all of the things that can happen to still be back there and to still get it done with some new faces. Yeah. It's just incre- incredible. Yeah. And like Corey Perry leaving the Montreal Canadiens, losing in the finals, going to Tampa Bay. Hopefully he can get a ring this. Like, <laughs> I left and went to the right team, boys. Yeah. We, he, was, he had to play against them, and he's like, fuck, I want to be on that side. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure a lot of people on the Canadiens were thinking that when the yeah. Stanley Cup finals happened. <laughs> yeah, and then just to give a little quick bump to the Canadiens, on a four-game heater since they've changed uh, owner or coach. So, yeah, they're, they're on a run. Caulfield's been doing really good. 
Yeah. Still, it's still, well, they're still way too far back to like. Oh yeah, way, do way anything, too far back. But I mean, to build confidence they, going into next year, they could not finish last. As actually, they're not dead last anymore. Phoenix Coyotes are now dead last with the number one draft pick, with thirty points. Dang. Everything's going downhill. I feel so bad for the whole Phoenix organization. Like, literally all the players that are there, I just feel so bad. Yeah, you never hear of any good news coming out of there. Well, well ever aside s- from them, them, like, oh, they signed their deal with ASU, and it's like, oh, yeah, they found, like, a new venue to, like, go to and stuff. But at the same time, it's like, well, that's good news. You're still t- taking a step down in a way. So it's like, your good ever news s- is still bad news. <laughs> yeah, once they re- ever since they relocated the team out of Phoenix – is when they started going downhill. That's when they had to file bankruptcy. That's when the NHL bought them and really are in full control, basically, of the NHL operations. And, I, I, you know, was that you that mentioned? Do you ever see, see them potentially being relocated? Yeah, I think I asked you about that a couple of weeks ago as far as another state or something. The only I could actually see them being relocated. Obviously, this deal is through like three years, I think, that they signed with ASU. Yeah, I think so too. If they can't have a rink built by then, like if they can't find land, buy, build a rink, do all that by then, I could really see them moving to a different city. Mm-hmm. Um, just need a fresh start. It's like, yeah, all the same players are still going to be on the team. You're just changing the city that it's in just to bring fans to the game. Because I feel, like I said, I feel so bad for them. They have like 20,000 stadium arena and they get like 4,000 fans like a night. Like you're playing in front of empty crowds, basically. Yeah. And to the players that are there, especially like a young player getting drafted there, it's like, fuck, is my career killed now? (laughs) Which I know, I mean, it'd be exciting for us. I can't remember the name of the family, but they own the Milwaukee Admirals and they own some other smaller franchises in the Milwaukee area where they kind of threw their name into the hat a couple years ago to try to bring the Coyotes to Milwaukee. Um, and now that they just built Fiserv, I know it can fit a hockey rink because I went to a college game not too long ago. I can't remember what their seating is. I think it's like 14,000, which isn't huge, but it's like, Bring the Coyotes to Milwaukee. Yeah, I don't think that would ever happen. You can't have NHL. You can't. You've got to be like further than like ninety miles apart from the next. Oh, closest team. Well, what about Kings and Anaheim? They're further than ninety miles. Are they? Oh, I'm. I'm almost pretty sure. Let me. Let's take or a look. San here. Jose. I don't know how far apart all those cities are. Anaheim to Los Angeles, 26 miles. Um, Let me double check this rule here. So I don't want to say incorrect. And then imagine San Jose is farther, but. That's crazy. I just pulled like a map thing. Anaheim and Los Angeles are 26 miles apart. Right now, it'd take you 52 minutes to drive that. Oh, traffic there, dude. That's just unreal. Because what about, like, uh, New York Rangers, Islanders, Devils, they all got to be within 50 miles of each other. Yeah, I'm trying to find out what the – maybe it wasn't – like I said, maybe it wasn't miles. Oh, fuck. That was with an expansion team, with a new team. It can't be within 90 miles oh, of, of a, a new team. organ. Yeah, that's what it is. Oh. Yeah, because I said, yeah, with the – the California teams, and then, like I said, too, Devils, Rangers, Islanders, they all got to be kind of the same distance, 20 to 50 miles apart. 
<clears throat> yeah, I think Milwaukee would be a little too small of a market for an NHL team anyway. Yeah, I heard some cities that uh, spit and chicklets threw around. They were saying Houston, because it's one of the fat, biggest cities in America. Houston, um, Kansas City, now that they don't mm-hmm. have anything re- like in Missouri. Um, all I have is the Chiefs, and you put an NHL team there, I'm sure. St. Louis can... Blues. <laughs> I feel like Kansas City and St. Louis aren't that far apart away from each, from each, from each other either. They're only a couple hours apart. Yeah, but since they're not a new NHL team, I don't think that they have that rule. Well, yeah, but I feel like there's better places that, to put. The Blues is already, I feel like, doesn't have a huge fan base, so you're going to put the Coyotes to compete with that only a couple oh, hours the away. Blues, the Blues have a huge fan base. They have a pretty yeah. good one. Well, I suppose just where they are. The next closest team is Blackhawks, probably, or Blue Jackets. Yeah, Columbus, that's on the other side of Detroit, probably. Minnesota would yeah. probably be the next. Yeah. But yeah, it does I'm not finding anything between moving cities that there's anything. So I I misspoke on that. That was just a new team. Okay. Sounds good. Well, yeah. Now, thanks everyone <laughs> for tuning in to today's episode of Offsides. I'll uh, be sure to tune back in tomorrow, where everything NHL, NFL will be broadcasted to you. <laughs>